Hey everybody, welcome back to another week of the Homebrew Web Development Course. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sampson, at Jonathan Sampson on Twitter, if you want to follow me. And tonight we're going to be picking up where we left off last week. So we're in the final kind of couple of turns towards closing out the HTML specification. We've talked about tons and tons of tags. There are areas that we've not yet gotten into, like the various attributes. There's a set of global attributes that are available on nearly every tag in the document. Um, there's some uh, tag specific attributes, for instance, um, the input uh, tag or the input element with a type equal to number also has attributes like max and min and step and, and we'll talk about those in the future I think but I, I'm guessing it might be more advantageous for us to wrap up some of the larger elements and then get into CSS and then we'll come back and start to talk about the more granular control of the elements um, in kind of the, the same vein as the CSS. So we'll be designing them and also specifying them uh, as well, a bit more control. So today I'm going to be in, I think we're starting in section 4.6, uh, which is text level semantics. I was going through the last week's video and it looks like um, towards the end we were talking about the time element, so we're wrapped up that. The code element, I think we also did that one. And uh, the next one here looks like it's 4612, the variable element. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Full screen. And infinite recursion right there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, my index page in Sublime. Okay, there we go. That should be big enough to see. So the next tag that we're going to be looking at here in the HTML5 specification, this is the W3C working draft, is the variable element. So this element, um, it's categorized as flow content and phrasing content, which means it can be dropped directly into a body, it can be dropped into a paragraph tag. Um, the context in which this element can be used is where phrasing content is expected. Content model is itself phrasing content, um, and the uh, content attributes. So that's the global attributes. It's something that we mentioned briefly just a few minutes ago, but we're not going to get too deep into. So the variable element represents an actual variable. So you can see here in the demo below that they say, um, you know, if there are in pipes leading to the ice cream factory, where in is obviously a, a variable, it's a placeholder for some other value. Um, then I expect at least, so least is emphasized here, uh, in flavors of ice cream to be available for purchase. So they've got two instances of the in variable inside there. We actually use um, this variable on the, uh, I'm sorry, we don't use variable, but we do use uh, that type of language over here on the learn site. So you can see I actually have over the next n months. Now I actually do not have uh, let's see. I don't have that marked up as an in variable. Um, I'm sorry, as a variable. I could, and now that's a variable tag. And uh, we actually get similarly the, the same rendering, of the, which is that implicit uh, italicizing of the text. But let's go ahead and drop in our own example here, and we'll say that, um, let's see. Today we wish to cover var uh, in sections of the W3C working draft. And as we expect, um, the text is going to be italicized for us by default, by virtue of it being a variable. So you can see that in right here is by default uh, italicized for us. Um, and so the they go on to say for mathematics in particular, uh, or anything beyond the simplest of expressions, MathML is more appropriate. Definitely not going to get into that. Um, so if you want to check out more of that, you definitely can. You can see here's another example they gave below, which is uh, kind of talk about Einstein's favorite uh, or popular expression, the e, e equals mc squared, where it's like energy equals mass and the speed of light or something like that, or another. And uh, you can see here too that the variables are marked up um, in a visual way that gives you an idea that there's something separate from the flow of the text itself. They're, they have extra semantic meaning to them. 
So the next thing after variable is the samp. Uh, the samp element represents sample output from a program or a computing system. So we're getting into some very um, kind of niche tags. And so, you know, here's an example here that actually, I, I don't know how often you would actually use these. I mean, you might use them if you're wanting to share with people something that your console output inside your browser, um, but these aren't going to be used a whole lot. So you can see here the computer said too much cheese in the tray too. So if, for instance, um, you know, you wanted to do a blog post and you were doing some work inside the console and you said, hey, I want to document.append child um, and then inside here I'm going to do a document.create child a div or create element rather div like oh I get this uh, exception here this item right here error hierarchy request error you might in fact say you know um, Todd I tried that script you sent me but the output Put in the console. The console said, and then this is where your SAMP comes in. So in this particular case, we're going to be putting that inside. So this is kind of uh, related to the code tag. So you can see that I actually have that uh, that console output there. So again, this it, it looks similar to the code tag. So if we were to say, um, maybe put another paragraph. I ran the following code and we close that off and then maybe come in here and put in the code tag which I think we talked about last week. We could say document.append child document.create element div and we could refresh the page here and you should see they they resemble each other very closely. The kind of implicit styling that the browser gives. So semantically they're different. Obviously one is a response from the computer and the other one is something that we're, a request we're giving to the computer. So that, that might actually come in more handy um, than I initially suspected, especially if you're going to be doing a, a programming tutorial blog or something like that and you want to mark things up semantically to inform the browsers and any other applications um, that uh, this is output from a console. So that is what the sample text is for. Uh, next up, oh, this is a cool one. <laughs> this is the keyboard element, KBD. So the KBD element represents user input, typically computer or keyboard input, although it may also be used to represent other inputs such as voice commands. Um, when the keyboard element is nested inside of a sample element, it represents the input as it was echoed by the system. So this is uh, this is pretty cool. The keyboard element, and this might be some uh, implicit styling that is available on another site. But let's go ahead and see real quick. Uh, I could say try pressing um, so Control plus, oops, Alt plus Delete. So this might be a command. But these three items here are actual inputs that we would be giving to the computer. So I'm going to put KBD around each of them. And the last one. And then we'll go back and view this inside the browser. So you notice it actually doesn't, um, it, it gives some implicit style uh, over here. But the, uh, the site that I was thinking of in my mind is Stack Overflow. And Stack Overflow actually does a bit more extra styling to the, the keyboard element. And so I could actually show you real quick um, if we went to... Stack Overflow, and we opened up just any one of these questions, and we paste it in the same code. So they have got some style sheets on their site um, that add extra stuff. So you can see actually right here, this is how they style the keyboard input. They actually make it look like keys on the keyboard, which is kind of a cool thing. So not only do you get semantic um, benefic or benefits from using these tags, but you can also target them. So if we wanted to do something similar, we could come up inside here, create a style tag, and we could say, hey, you know, for every keyboard element, we're going to give it a background of um, light blue 
and we're going to give a border radius of 0.25 m's. So that's one quarter the size of the text itself. And we refresh that, and you notice we now have something very similar to what Stack Overflow had. And so we could further come in and say we're also going to give it a box shadow of um, zero pixels from the left, 0.1 m from the top, and maybe 0.1 m blur, and we'll give that a color of black. So this is short code CSS syntax. Don't worry about it too much because we're going to be getting into this more in the future. So now we give a little bit of drop shadow to that. This is just kind of the cool stuff you can do. So that's something similar to what Stack Overflow is doing. But now we're way off track. <laughs> we were talking about the keyboard tag, uh, which represents input. So it breaks uh, down a bit more uh, granular semantically as well. So we saw that when the keyboard element is nested inside of a SAMP element, it represents the input as it was echoed by the system. And when the keyboard element contains a SAMP element, it represents input based on system output, for example, invoking a menu item. Um, let's see here. So when the keyboard element is nested inside of another keyboard element, it represents an actual key or other single key unit of input as appropriate for the input mechanism. And then I give a, a few different examples, but we just did that. So you can check out those examples if you like. Next item here is um, sub and soup. So these are kind of helpful, especially with um, references to footnotes and stuff like that, or even uh, you know mathematical equations at, at times. But we'll we'll see how they use them here. Or even yeah, this is um, uh, suffixes to dates and stuff as well. So the sub and soup elements are expected wherever phrasing content is expected. Um, they are themselves, they have a content model of phrasing content, and they represent superscript and subscript. So just a quick example of that, I could put um, Jonathan in normal text, and then in superscript, my last name, Samson. And what that does, if you're not familiar with superscript, is it kind of elevates it up. It, it, it makes it a little bit smaller and puts it up higher. So that might make more sense if we were saying like, you know, two to the third power or whatever, um, you know, you start to see kind of how that would be used. And so they, they probably talk about that a little bit here as well. So these elements must be used only to mark up typographical conventions with specific meanings, not for typographical presentation for presentation's sake. So that first comment there is kind of what we've talked about in the past that a lot of these tags have uh, an implicit visual effect on the element itself when it gets on the page. But we shouldn't use the tag to acquire that visual effect. Our number one priority when we select tags to wrap around content should be the semantics, the meaning of the tag itself. So that's, a, that's essentially what they're saying here. For example, it would be inappropriate for the sub and soup elements to be used in the name of uh, the latex document preparation system. In general, authors should use these elements only if the absence of those elements would change the meaning of the content. And certain languages, subscripts are part of the typographical conventions for some abbreviations. Uh, let's see, probably a better example for us would be this example down here. So the, the sub element can be used instead of a var element for variables that have subscripts. Um, this particular instance here, you can see we have where, where let's just grab this whole section here and drop it into our our document real quick. And we'll pull that open. Ah, I just opened Opera. <laughs> My bad. So here you can see that they're actually uh, they're using the um, for instance the subscript around this uh, ten that follows the x variable. It's actually part of the variable itself, so that's what puts the 10 down there lower. That's essentially how you'd mark up this type of stuff here. I need to close Opera. So, yeah, I hate, I, I always accidentally click on this stuff. I apologize. So, you can also use those. Um, maybe we said today is the, what is it, the 14th? 18th. I'm way off. Uh, is April 18th. And so right here we could do the superscript. 
for the TH. And we've got that. So superscript puts it up and subscript puts it down. Just like that. So that is uh, sub and soup right there, or the sub, sub tag, sub man. <laughs> Coolest tag in HTML. The I element. This is uh, like its siblings, more phrasing content, and the I element represents a span of text in an alternate voice or mood or otherwise offset from the normal prose in a manner indicating a different quality of text, such as a taxonomic designation, a technical term, an idiomatic phrase from another language, a thought, or a ship name in Western texts. That last one was kind of out of, out, out of left field, a ship name in Western texts. So you can see here in their instances that the one they have the first example here, they're using taxonomy, so Feliz Silvestris Catus. Um, the second one here is prose content. And there is a certain, and of course, they're going to be using a idiom from French, je ne sais quoi, in the air. So those are instances where you would use I uh, to kind of show a different intonation or something or, or different... Um, as they, as they said, a change in your mood or your tone of voice. So you can see how some of these tags are just a little strange. Um, I is actually also used by... Hello, Nicholas. I is actually also used um, in some frameworks like uh, Bootstrap, Twitter Bootstrap. It actually represents an icon. So you'll see there's some variability in the way people handle this. Um, yeah, use your discretion. Uh, what in the world? I'm all zoomed in. Okay, so next is the B element. Let me zoom in a little bit, I guess. So the B element is, like its siblings, all phrasing content. The B element represents a span of text to which attention is being drawn for utilitarian purposes without conveying any extra importance and with no implication of an alternate voice or mood, such as keywords in a document, abstract product names in a review, actionable words in interactive text-driven software, or an article lead. Um, video has been going fantastic, Nicholas, though we have been sadly depressed in the absence of your presence, but welcome. We love you. <laughs> the following example shows a use of the B element to highlight keywords without making them without marking them up as important. So you can see here the frabonator <laughs> and barbinator. Barbinator components are fried. They're not marking these up as important. They're simply identifying them in, in contrast to the rest of the statement around them. So following example objects in a text adventure are highlighted as being special by the use of B. So uh, here we can take this and we'll actually drop this into our code and for anyone who is old enough to remember these old text-based games you can see in this instance um, they're bolding keywords um, but not because they changed the tone or anything like that so it's still read you enter a small room and your sword glows brighter a rat scurries past the corner wall in my best text adventure game voice so those words are, there's an emphasis on them because they're important, but not in necessarily the tone or the mood or anything. So that, uh, that is the, uh, the B. In the past, it was, people always thought those to be italics and bold because the I tag, if we actually come in here and say, we'll wrap those around small room. And we refresh. You can see it, it does make it italicized, and the B does make it bold. But, again, we don't use tags for their visual um, artifacts. So th while it may make something italicized, we don't necessarily do that because we want something to be italicized. And we don't use the B tag because we want to bold something. Next item is the U element. Let's see here. The U element, uh, we typically saw that as underlined. Um, 
it is like its siblings more phrasing content. The U element represents a span of text with an unarticulated, though explicitly rendered, non-textual annotation, such as labeling the text as being a proper name in Chinese text, a Chinese proper name mark, or labeling the text as being misspelt. So if you were going through and you were correcting someone's paper, say you're a, a school teacher or something, and um, someone submits, today I'm learning HTML. Obviously, there's a spelling mistake in here. Uh, there's two I's, of course. Um, you might actually want to come in here and to mark that as uh, being misspelled, you could actually come in here and say you. You could actually give that a class too and say spelling if you wanted to. And in styles up here at the top, we could say, hey, you know, we want uh, any you with a spelling class to be a color of red. And let's see. You can see that that's precisely what we get. Um, that's marked up now that this is a spelling mistake, and we've also given it a class of spelling so that we could target it up here and say every U element that has a spelling class uh, should be marked up as red. And we could probably even say, hey, text decoration, blink, buddy. And oh, hold on a second. <laughs> this is. No! Okay, I don't get to blink. Unfortunately, the browsers don't support that. But we still get what we have here. So that is the U tag. Can you see without the red? Yep, this is uh, without the red right here. So we've taken the class away, so now it's just U, which means this, uh, this selector here no longer works. It's not U with spelling. Uh, we don't have spelling, so this is no longer selecting our element on the page. And the result is just the text is being underlined. So you can kind of think of the U as being an underline, however you would use that. Uh, in most cases, another element is likely to be more appropriate for marking stress emphasis. The EM element should be used for marking keywords or phrases, either the B element or the mark element which we'll talk about here momentarily, should be used. And depending on the context for marking book titles, the cite element should be used. For labeling text with explicit textual annotations, the Ruby element should be used. And for labeling ship names in Western texts, the I element should be used. I'm going to have to remember that. For labeling ship names in Western texts. It's kind of crazy that <laughs> you, you get support for ship names in Western text, but the H group tag has no sufficient use to stay inside the W3C specifications. So that's, that's crazy. The, uh, the next item is the Ruby element. Um, we just talked about that a little bit here. The Ruby element allows one or more spans of phrasing content to be marked with Ruby annotations. Ruby annotations are short runs of text presented alongside base text, primarily used in East Asian typo typography as a guide for pronunciation or to include other annotations. In Japanese, this form of typography is also known as furigana. Um, I, yeah, so here you can see an example of Ruby, <laughs> the Ruby tag being used. I don't do anything with Japanese. If you do, feel free to drop back into the specification and play a bit with the Ruby element. I think RT is associated with that. Yes, it is, Ruby text, so we will skip that. RP, this is a child of the Ruby element, which means we're going to skip that as well. That's uh, way out of uh, our kind of sphere of interest, unless we have anyone who's specifically going to be working with uh, Ruby items or with Japanese. BDI, so this is the tag I've never heard of. Let's see, it's uh, phrasing content. Um, used in areas where phrasing content is expected. Uh, let's see here. The BDI element represents a span of text that is to be isolated from its surroundings for the purposes of bi-directional text formatting. My goodness. So, um, yeah. The element is especially useful when embedding user-generated content with an unknown directionality. 
I get this. Okay. So English is top to bottom, left to right. Um, Hebrew is different. Arabic is different. All those types of things. So in this example, usernames are shown alongside with the number of posts that the user has submitted. If the BDI element were not used, the username of the Arabic user would end up confusing the text. The bidirectional algorithm would put the colon and the number three next to the word user. I see. Rather than next to the word posts. So let's just take a look at this real quick. This is precisely why I've never used it because I'm not using a bidirectional text inside of a single document. But maybe you will. Who knows? So we've got some Arabic here. Uh, let's jump over to the page. Refresh that. So we see it's user Arabic three posts. If we take the BDI out, so now we just have the user followed by Arabic. Arabic, of course, is uh, written right to left, I believe. Um, that does indeed mess up <laughs> our document here. So you can see why the bidirectional tag is used there. That's, that's awesome. It's a good example. Um, I won't be using it a whole lot, but I do know that it exists now. So if you ever do any bidirectional stuff, it actually is super helpful. I, I did notice uh, on Stack Overflow a while back, whenever I was testing out things, I did set my username to a Hebrew text. So that might be something you're doing. Like For instance, if you got a Bible study class or something, and you want to paste in the Hebrew word uh, for firmament or something, you might actually want to, um, if you want to say, you know, the Hebrew word for firmament is blah, blah, blah. You might actually want to wrap that in the bidirectional tag. So there's a, a good, solid application. There's also a um, PHP, uh, let's, is a PHP uh, item in the PHP language that has a, a Hebrew name. I'll have to look that up, but it, it is a really crazy thing. Let me actually, I'm going to do that right now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to go to PHP Shama. I it's the double dot syntax so it means two dots. I'm going to find it real quick. So uh, yeah I think Hebrew teaching, I'm not teaching Hebrew, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be teaching Hebrew in the future PHP sounds cool though. So here we go. The scope resolution operator in PHP. Um, this is here we go. This is this is cool. So we'll see if we can make this work. I'll go back and share my full screen. You know, we just had Shmuley in here who probably I could be like totally stereotypical, but I think he might understand some Hebrew. Um, we'll have to ask him in the future. Uh, let's see here. So you can see my screen. The um, the scope resolution operator in PHP is called the Pamaim Nekudotayim, <laughs> and just means double dot twice or twice colon. And so we may in fact you know want to copy some of this Hebrew text here and say. Um, uh, P, it's the, or the scope resolution operator. So in this case, let's see what happens with this comma that's right there next to the text. Everything seems to be all right. Is this going to be a bad example? <laughs> I'm not going to have a good example here. Okay, but I think in this particular case, we would still put in the BDI tags uh, just in case maybe because this is the type of stuff we want to be safe against. So the Arabic was a much better example probably because the editors of the W3C specification knew it would be a better example. Kudos to them. BDO, um, let's see here. So this is uh, where phrasing content is expected. The content attributes are a little bit different. So it has the global attributes which we'll talk about in the future a bit more. Um, the direction global attribute has special semantics on this element in particular, so we'll, we'll talk about that in the future as well. 
Video Element represents explicit text directionality formatting control for its children. It allows authors to override the Unicode bidirectional algorithm by explicitly specifying a direction override. Skipping this. This is definitely way out of uh, our wheelhouse. Um, the span element, we talked about this in the past. Uh, the span element is phrasing content, expect where phrasing content is expected. Um, it doesn't mean anything on its own. So this is kind of like the div. If you guys remember doing uh, some some demos with the div tag, the div tag was kind of that uh, go-to tag that anytime you just need to grab some stuff. So for instance, you know, we mentioned having a couple articles, for instance, inside here. Um, if we wanted to handle both of these together, we could wrap them in this semantically meaningless tag called div. And we could give that div a class of articles, plural or something. And then, of course, we could come inside here with style tags. And we could target div articles, and we could give that like a color of red if we want to change the text of those or something. So the div was the meaningless block level element. And what that block level means is that it, it, it blocks both of its sides. It does not... Uh, you can't put it in a sentence, for instance, because it would it would take up as much horizontal space as it possibly can. So if we were just to put a div inside here, say we have this div, it's empty. We will give it a height of 10 pixels, though, and we'll give it a border 1 pixel solid red. Uh, you can see the structure of the div. So you notice this div goes as far left and right as it possibly can. Not so with the span. So if we were to put a span down here with a class of articles, the span, actually you can't see it yet. Let me uh, put something inside here. Oh, come on, what am I doing? Oh, we're going to take away the tag in the selector so it's just a class. So anything with this class will have these uh, styles applied to it. And as you can see, the span just covers phrasing content. It's in line. It only takes as much horizontal space as is needed by its children. So in this particular case, the child is this A letter, which means the span is not going to be any wider than that. The div, on the other hand, takes up all that horizontal space. So if you need a meaningless um, kind of tag, if we have a, uh, a paragraph of text, and I really, you know, need to target just a couple of the words in this paragraph, then I could come back and drop in that meaningless uh, span, just a, and you know, add a class to that, maybe of article, since we already have that up, up there, articles. And now you notice know, so I can actually target just a. So, I actually have a couple A's inside there. That is the, the span. It doesn't mean anything. It's just kind of a meaningless tag for you to do some stuff with. Um, kind of like the div, but it's inline. BR, we talked about uh, BR is to kind of uh, manually put in line returns. Yes, I spelled it style because I'm chic like that. So, BR, we have the same text here. Uh, if I wanted to put in a break after uh, or between the word couple and of, obviously because white space is ignored inside HTML, I could I could put all the line returns in here. Doesn't do anything, but if I come in there and I put in a br tag, self closing or not doesn't really matter. It actually forces the line return right there. And so I've got one BR tag. You could put in a second BR tag. Um, typically, if you find yourself needing to put in multiple BR tags, it probably means you're using the BR tag incorrectly. It might mean that you need to have paragraph tags. So instead of having two BR tags right here, I could come in and wrap these in two separate paragraphs. And that was probably the, the best thing semantically to do if I'm trying to use multiple paragraph or multiple breaks like that. Um, in sequence to one another. So that's what the uh, the BR is for. It's for a line break. 
WBR is for a word break, I believe. Uh, it's phrasing content has an um, empty content model. So you'll notice, let's see here. If I take away these paragraphs and we go back to the text that we had, well, notice the, uh, the sentence breaks after the word need and it breaks after the word in because of the dimensions of the browser and the size of the text. If I come in here and I go after the word need and I put in a WBR. Oops, that's not doing what I was thinking it would do. So WBR element represents a line break opportunity. So that's, yes, I have that completely opposite. So let me break that out and put one before need and see if this does what I expect. It does not. <laughs> okay, let's actually just read the, the text here. In the following example, someone is quoted as saying something which for effect is uh, written as one long word, I see. I see. So if we had like that supercalifragilisticexpialidocious thing, let's let's do that. So supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. In this particular case, we have a extremely long word that's probably horribly misspelled. Um, let me make it a little bit bigger here. Actually, I'm going to reduce the size of my browser. So you notice that the, the word cannot break. There's no place for it to break whenever we're resizing the browser like this. The, uh, what I can do, though, is I can actually put in the WBR in places where I'm okay with it breaking. So that might be on um, at the end of something like super, put in WBR for that's a word break opportunity there. Uh, and then I might put in one, oops, maybe after califragilistic and XB Alley, maybe another one there. And so I've defined three different places where my word can break. And so now you notice that in those three places, it actually will break. So I have super califragilistic XB Alidocious. So if you have a very long word like that and you want it to break whenever the browser is requesting that it break, you can explicitly state where in the word it should break. So that is the word break opportunity tag. The next one here is, um, that's the usage summary. So we've pretty much gone through all of them. We could check these out again. I wonder if I could even use this in my emails to follow up with what we were doing. So uh, section here is non-normative. Normative means you know, there might be some differences browser to browser. Uh, but real quick, the anchors represent hyperlinks. So in this case, you can see here, the anchor points to a drinks at HTML. EM is for a stress emphasis. I must say I adore lemonade. That's how we mark that up. I'm stressing adore. Strong is for importance. This T is very hot. So I'm stressing the importance of very hot. Small is for side comments. These grapes are made into the vine. Alcohol is addictive. Uh, inaccurate text. So here's the strike through. We actually saw this puts a line through its contents. So obviously there's a price reduction here that they're illustrating. Cite is the title uh, or the titles of works. So the case Hugo versus Daniel is relevant here. Quotations, those are those inline quotes. Um, the judge said you can drink water from the fish tank, but advised against it, and that will put the double quotes around the text for us, and that is also used inside of a sentence, so there's no separation like we have with the block quote tag. Uh, defining instance, so that's the um, first time you mention organic food, for instance, in this uh, text here. The text organic food refers to food produced without synthetic chemicals. So if you were doing like the legal documentation, where at the very beginning you're saying, you know, you, the client, this represents your company. You might say, you know, the you is a defining instance or the client is a defining instance or something like that. Abbreviations, so organic food in Ireland is certified by the, and then they just have IOFGA. 
but they put inside the abbreviation with the title Irish Organic Farmers and Growers Association. And if you recall correctly, um, whenever we have those uh, and you hover over an abbreviation, the browser will actually pop up oftentimes the text of the um, what that abbreviation stands for. Time is the machine readable equivalent of date or time related data. So in this case, we see there's an availability starting on um, 2011, 11, 12. This is the machine readable date. This is something computers understand. It's a very understandable, understandable and familiar format. And then inside here, um, we have the human readable. So you can write whatever you want inside of a time tag, just as long as the date time attribute is text that can be accurately parsed and understood and interpreted by the machine. So code here is computer code. Uh, you can see the fruit DB program can be used for tracking fruit production. Um, we might as well also use actual programming languages inside there like you know PHP or JavaScript or even HTML as we did last week I believe. Uh, VARs for variables. We saw that one as well today where the in in this case represents a variable uh, amount or variable value, a variable object. SAMP is for computer output. So this is, uh, we saw a JavaScript um, error that we then documented using the SAMP tag. Keyboard, we checked that out on Stack Overflow and saw ways that they uh, add additional visual styling to that to make it look like keys on the keyboard. Um, and in fact, that's what they're doing here. They're instructing you to use this to reference certain input from the user. Then we have the subscripts and superscripts. Um, those are two, of course. Uh, in this case, we see that they're saying water is H2O. So two, of course, is uh, the number of hydrogen atoms. Um, and the, uh, let's see, subscripts here, superscripts, we saw that as well. Uh, let's see, alternative voice, alternative voice, rather. Uh, lemonade consists primarily of citrus limon. Um, keywords, take a lemon, and squeeze it with a juicer. So these are the two keywords. I actually changed my tone, which I shouldn't have, because uh, these are not necessarily a change in tone, but these are just keywords in a text. Annotations, we saw that with you. Oh, check that out. So they actually use the same class as we did. We said spelling, they use spelling. Um, so this text is obviously misspelled. Um, mark, we didn't talk about mark. So here is, uh, let's see what they're doing here. We'll just grab their text. But mark is like if you were to highlight um, some text. So I'm not going to use their text. I'm just going to do our own. So let's see, we'll do a paragraph. Jonathan Sampson is teaching us HTML. The mark tag, if we wanted to draw special emphasis to teaching, we could come over here and mark that. The effect of this is really cool. You can see it actually, it's like you pass a highlighter over it. It's very cool. So if you have a document where you're trying to mark up text on there, uh, this is definitely a way you could do it. I have in the past, being completely honest, I did not know the mark tag existed until this evening. In the past, I've used the span, and I would have done things like, you know, span class equals uh, mark or or maybe in the past I would have said something like HL for highlight. And then what we could do is we'd come up inside our CSS and say, hey, HLs, y'all have a background color of yellow now, okay? And then what you wind up with is the same thing using the span tag, which is that meaningless inline tag, um, but semantically it doesn't mean the same thing. So if a browser or a search engine comes across and starts crawling through our code, uh, it's going to see teaching as a highlighted word. It's not going to see Samson as a highlighted word because it doesn't make any sense. Um, span does not necessarily mean highlighted, but mark unequivocally does. So that's a really cool thing you can use, especially if you're marking up documents. Ruby annotations, we're not going to touch that. Um, we see here the uh, text directionality isolation with the BDI. So they're not using um, Arabic here. Uh, they're just using typical, you know, English characters. Uh, there's a French thingy there. So cafe, an accent over there, e. 
span is an other, so um, we see here in this particular instance where in French we call it uh, Siro I guess is how you would say that, but uh, you can actually identify the language of this as well as um, you can come back later on say we had this inside our document, I'll put that inside a paragraph because the span has got this language FR we could say that we want all um, lang fr items to have a color of green, for instance. And so that's the entire text. So we might actually want to put something else inside here and say, ah, uh, this is a span. What do you think, Willis? And so you can see, actually, the um, this item here is green because it has the French language attribute. And we've based this CSS selector off of the language uh, attribute with the value fr. So that's a, kind of a cool thing you typically would find yourself using the span tag for. Lastly, uh, we have the break, the line break. We just talked about that. And you can see here they're using it inside this address, Simply Orange Juice Company, line break. Popka, Florida, 32703, Line Break USA, and the Line Break Opportunity. So in this particular case, this is a good example. Um, they are marking up a web page address, and they're saying, you know, in our URL, simplyorangejuice.com, these are the areas where we're okay with it wrapping. So as it wraps, it wraps in such a way that you can still easily see the text, uh, it doesn't wrap kind of in a random location and it doesn't force a scroll bar prematurely or anything as well. So that is all of section 4.6 I believe. Good times, good times. Um, we are towards the end here. I think we can take safely a few minutes and if anyone has any questions or something they want to discuss that you know we went through this evening or something we might have went through last week uh, all questions are fair game, or maybe it's just JavaScript, CSS, PHP, anything else, just about anything else. Um, we can take a few minutes and discuss it. Uh, if not, then we'll wrap this up, and I'll start working on the um, newsletter for next week that will go out with the review information in it and uh, kind of a suggestion of what we'll probably talk about next week as well, provided we're able to do the class and do the meetup. So any questions? Any questions at all? Speak now, speak now, forever hold your peace. Any CSS questions? Are you guys wanting to know how to style certain things a certain way or accomplish certain effects or do something with JavaScript or jQuery? we got about 10 minutes. You could hold your peace until next week. That would work as well. Um, if there's uh, nothing at all, then I appreciate you guys hanging out with me yet again this week. And uh, I hope to have the emails going out so that everyone has adequate heads up and sufficient uh, warning that we're going to be doing another class. Um, what do you guys think? Should we send out the emails the morning of? Um, or should we send them out maybe a day in advance? What would be more beneficial to you guys for your schedules? Because I'm kind of torn. For me, my schedule is so crazy. I, I need to be warned like 12 times before something starts. So uh, it's in advance might be a bit better. So I'll try this. I will try to send out the email on Wednesday next week instead of Thursday. And uh, it'll just be a reminder that... Um, you know, Thursday. I might send out two, you know, I might send out one on Wednesday and then just a reminder on Thursday morning or something. Um, yeah, I mean, it's there. You have the problem where it might be familiar in your inbox and you might just kind of mentally sort it out. But there's also the other problem if you send it too early, there's people who get tons of email and it might be completely covered in an avalanche. So maybe I'll, I'll send out, I'll have to see if I can send out two emails maybe one on Wednesday one on Thursday um, we will see but anyway thank you guys for hanging out with me um, see y'all next week